in my district, I don't even have a community center. The closest one is about three miles away. Uh, and one of my precincts has had one of the highest gun violence in the city. So we know what works. Uh, I'm going to be quiet now so that uh, we can t uh, go to questions. But the question is, why are we not doing? Like, we, we, I think we have enough research to show what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The question is, why are we not applying it? Why it's taking so long? To okay, thank you. I think it's important for scholars to also take some responsibility to try and um, make sense of their own research in terms of policy and strategy decisions. So my question to Todd and Geert is that, so what we've learned is that a low, in lower disadvantaged neighborhoods in places like Boston, in places like Trenton, prison lowers crime, but in higher disadvantaged neighborhoods, prison increases crime. But then in Newark, it's different. Um, and it may be because in Newark, that levels of disadvantage, you reach a saturation point where things almost become so rigid they don't move anymore, which to me is a, a fascinating thing and has, as, as the panelists rightly said, big implications for many pockets of New York City. But the question is, so where do we go from here in understanding this and how would this impact the strategies that we take? So let me, let me uh, start by saying that um, <clears throat> we often uh, talk about uh, uh, incarceration policy in the United States as though it's one story, because it's easy to tell it one story. It's uh, you know 40 years of growing prison populations, uh, whether crime rates went up or down, whether the economy was good or bad, or uh, at war and at peace, with in increasing numbers of uh, young men coming into the uh, uh, at-risk age groups and then numbers dropping and so on. So. When we talk about that story, it's a, it's a, it's a good story, it's a, it's a good story in line, but it's actually not the truth. Um, because the truth is there are 51 different incarceration policy stories out there, because incarceration policy is actually produced uh, at the state level. But I, but, and the MacArthur Foundation recently talking about looking at jails, one of the things you'll see is that we'll begin to understand better is that incarceration policy is actually produced at, at municipal levels as well. And I think our research suggests that it's actually produced at the neighborhood level. And we have, in that sense, we have a sample uh, of three. And uh, nobody would want to make conclusions about the human race after talking to three humans. Uh, so I think it's very, uh, I think what we've learned in our work. So in Tallahassee, I think we learned that um, incarceration rates uh, matter for uh, impoverished neighborhoods, and they produce problems for those neighborhoods. And we learned it partly because the research was quantitative, but, uh, but in that work, we did a lot of qualitative work as well. And one of the things I was hearing here made me think that uh, when we were interviewing people, residents of these communities, one of them said, you know, if this was going on in a white community, it would never be, never be allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so African Americans in these neighborhoods that have been affected by high rates of prison cycling have gotten it for a long time. And us sort of social scientists and and people who are at arm's length from those places are so finally beginning to get it. But it has not, it's not a new finding. It's a, that finding has been out there for, uh, for 20 years for the people who've been, been experiencing it. But the problem is that the, that the stories are very, very local. And, um, and so I think that also means very problematically that the solutions are also quite local. Um, it's going to take uh, social capital um, of the type that we just heard here, a political capital of the type we just heard here. Now, I believe very much that there's an overarching story as well. If the United States tomorrow said we are going to go back to the prison policies of 1980, the sentencing policies of 1980, starting tomorrow, those are the sentencing policies. Within five years, we would have 1980s prison policies. That's how simple it is. Now, getting there is very difficult. So there, so there is an overarching story. But in terms of the impact on people, uh, it is so place-specific. And that, that I think we would be very, so I live and work, I don't live, I, I work in Newark, I feel like I live there, I'm there so much. Newark is different. Newark's different than New York, very different. It's different than any other place I, I've lived, you know. So th what happens in Newark is going to have to be Newark specific. Um, and I think that'll be true, you know, in neighborhoods in the Bronx and in neighborhoods in the Brooklyn and so forth. So I wish I, I, wish I could say there are five things you can do. I told you the big thing, uh, but that's a takeaway. Uh, but the other things are really much more complicated, much more nuanced, and much more. Local. Thank you. Sure. Uh, 
because to that point, which is very important, getting 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 communities, different places to be involved in policing is is immensely important. We don't do it. We have a cookie cutter uh, policing procedure. But uh, I try to speak to everybody, whether people um, agree with them or don't, because I find you can learn a lot from people. So I spent a lot of time speaking with George Kelling. People may boo. Um, he created uh, he created theory of broken windows. Um, but two things that I learned is uh, he admits that it doesn't have to be police that fix a broken window. Uh, so that was something that was made up after. And the second is that communities need to be involved in policing and what they see police should be focused on and not focused on, which is sounds very progressive. If someone else said it, um, you would probably listen. So I listened when he said it because it made sense and it's something that he just repeated. What is, we did, what the policing that we're doing in Newark may not be the same uh, that we're doing in Brooklyn. Uh, East Flappish maybe in the Caribbean community might be different than what we're going to focus on in Williamsburg, uh, the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, in Borough Park. So getting people involved in policing, uh, in what they want police to focus on and how they want to police is, is act very, very important. And I think when we talk about community policing and things of, uh, which community policing is now a catchphrase for a lot of things, but when we talk about getting other folks involved uh, in public safety, it's viewed as soft on crime. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's so much better on crime and there's so many places that show uh, that when communities get engaged in that way, um, it, it helps at a much better rate than um, than what we're doing now. Well, we have a community affairs unit in NYPD. That's not community police. Uh, in D.C., I spoke to Chief Lanier. She actually got rid of her uh, community affairs unit, and everybody was tasked with doing that community work. And what happened there was the, they got other issues, but what happened there was the clearance rate went up. That means they were solving crimes more because the people were providing better information. Um, and now if you have a community affairs unit, um, that deal with community, then what are the other police supposed to do? That means that that's not part of their job description, which I see uh, as a problem. I'm happy the community affairs unions are there, and they didn't get enough praise uh, back in the day, but they're getting it now. But it, it should be immersed into the entire system. Thank you. Okay, so we'll open up uh, uh, for any questions from the audience. You'd like to answer? Okay, sure. well, please. While we're waiting for uh, sure. uh, questions from the audience and for the audience to come up to the microphones, I thought I would add uh, one dimension, one particular dimension. And if you want to talk about what we have to do about changing uh, the, the incarceration rate, the way the criminal justice system works in this country right now, we, all, we, we can all, we, I think we have to keep in mind um, not just a local story, but also kind of a global story that has to do uh, with um, and the way this particularly this global story works, particularly in the United States. So, the 1970s or 1960s, uh, when crime rate, you know, when uh, incarceration rates much 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 lower, uh, but partially has to do with sentencing and all those different things. But also, uh, we lived in a very kind of different economy. Right here comes my economics department uh, uh, background. Right, uh, the, 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 the tax rates, for example, right, if you go back to the tax, rate, tax rates of uh, the, the 1980, right, they would be very different. Um, right, if you we, if we have to keep in mind that there's a massive, right, there's a couple things that have happened, right, one is the, uh, the, 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 the way race uh, functions in the United States has shifted, and also there's a, a large change in the way the capitalism functions in the United States. So there is, if you would look at graphs of exploding incarceration, if you would put a graph that you can change, you can keep the same graph almost, but change it to income inequality or, and, and all those different things. So it's not just incarceration, that's one part of the story, but uh, there's lots of economic dimensions that have changed as well. So that, I, guess, I think those things have to be addressed as well, mm -hmm. which is not uh, just the local things and it's the, part of the massive growth of poverty, inequality, and so on uh, uh, since 1980 or so, uh, right? It, and, and part of this, you know, the prison populations exist and are so large in order to manage these uh, populations that are left over behind in poverty and so on. So, any other questions? Uh, Julia? Um, 
I mean, I'm, I, I, I sit here nodding. I just want to want to throw something out there, and it's, it's not measurable and probably intangible, and everybody will probably kick me out of here. But you know, um, let's keep faith in the conversation. You know, we have faith communities on on every other block in some of these neighborhoods. And what better resource can our faith communities be than to be a hub, be that place where someone gets out and they can go to a church? You know, I had a quick story. We were at another site, and, and, you know, churches want to be welcoming. And many of the sacred books talk about you know, welcoming the prisoner, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this one church said, uh, you know, we had some gang members coming in, and we were trying to do some gang intervention work. And they were really excited initially, and, you know, Six months into the project, you know, one of the church elders came to me and said, you know, we want you to take the program elsewhere. I said, well, what's wrong? You know, this is what we want to do. And they said, well, you got to understand, you know, we, we, there's a lot of people and some people aren't uncomfortable, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay, fine. And I'm like, but it still doesn't make sense. And, and finally, the, the last thing they could come up with said, you know the concrete steps? That, I don't know, these churches have these huge concrete steps that, you know, lead to the big church doors. He said, you know, the concrete steps are wearing down. And I knew I had a loss. I, you know, I was, I was lost. You know, there's some mental health stuff that goes beyond prison that's undiagnosed in some areas that we really need to look at. But, again, I think I just want to throw out there that there's, there's so many opportunities for us to be this hub where we can do some of this work. And I think that, you know, and it's just a charge to the faith communities that what better place to do that than in those spaces. Uh, thank you. Okay, and we have our first question. If you could say um, very briefly who you are and then um, you get to tell us your question. Certainly. My name is Michelle Knox. I am a work readiness instructor at the HOPE program in Brooklyn. So uh, what we do is we work with about half of our constituents are formerly incarcerated, also people who are in substance abuse programs and just having a hard time re-entering the workforce. We teach job readiness skills and then do um, employment services so we help people get and keep jobs. So I'm looking at this from the perspective that we are doing our small part to help combat the effects that incarceration is having on the community. What you, as, as you said, Mr. Clear, this is information that we pretty much already knew organically. Um, how could an organization like mine use your information when we are soliciting funding to help, help our funders understand that this is all tied in? Because we get it, I'm not so sure everybody else gets it. You know, one of the, I'll just say one of the problems I think is that all of the service providers have been put in competition with each other yeah. for for a fixed pool of funds, and uh, it is really problematic. I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Let me just say two things that will be pretty unsatisfactory, I'm afraid. But um, one is that um, there is a, a movement afoot for a social impact bond framework. There's actually an experiment going on in New York. I'm on the board, um, and it has as its foundation that the private sector sets aside money for doing investments in socially uh, uh, prudent uh, enterprise can invest in uh, uh, st structures like yours, yours and then uh, the savings that the benefits you guys produce roll back to pay them back for their investment. Uh, there's complications here, there's plenty, but I think if we can create the size uh, of scale of the small units right now that are forced to compete with each other for resources, but if we can bring them into under an umbrella and start treating them as a collection of interventions and then start funding them through this social impact bond framework, I think we would have some ability to take this out of the, uh, the government has to be involved, but it, but it really, the money is not in the government, the money is in the private sector. And, and uh, to the extent the private sector can see that by creating a better social foundation for business, business improves, that if these things actually produce savings that generate payback for those investments, it makes the whole story true. Now, there's plenty of problems with social impact, ram, bound, social impact bond framework. I don't want to minimize that, but I think it gives us the capacity to start thinking strategically about another way of funding that work. Thank you. And 
Uh, Jamani, you'd like to speak to this too. Sure. Uh, one, I just want to, somebody mentioned capitalism. And that, so that's the one thing that worries me when I'm trying to do this because capitalism benefits from a lower class. I mean, you have super rich because you have super poor. So I'm trying to figure out how much they actually, or how much this thing is actually going to work. And the, 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 the only good thing about racism is you can look at me and see where I belong in the social strata. Um, so that I'm easily identifiable of where I belong and what should happen to me. And so that's a problem. Uh, I don't, I'm not necessarily sure uh, how to fix. We've got to keep pushing it, and we have to kind of change, I guess, what we believe is most important in life to try to deal with that. But um, with your direct question, the one thing I've tried to do, in, because I come from nonprofits, funders also put uh, on nonprofits uh, too much. You are forced to answer questions of how you're going to benefit an entire population. And so what I've been trying to figure out is how to make them understand that you cannot, the work that you do, even if you help a thousand people, may not change the direction of the entire population. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm hoping that nonprofits uh, and funders will begin to reach, change the conversation about what's asked. So my hope is that there's something called results-based accountability, mm -hmm. RBA, that I've used uh, to try to change um, how we answer some of the questions that they ask, uh, performance measures, uh, versus population indicators, uh, so that it's the it's more than just the work that you're doing that they're forcing you to be responsible for the entire population. Okay, and next question. Hi, my name is Isabel New. I am a reporter from Columbia Journalism School, and I'm very interested in um, the topic of reentry and how it affects family. And I know um, our panelists today have talked about it, but I would I was wondering if you could elaborate. Uh, um, how families are affected financially, especially by, you know, uh, some people come out of prison with a lot of debt, a lot of child support arrears, so um, could you please talk about that? Thank you. Kate, can you take that one? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I think um, it's a lot of the things that you said, and I can't remember if it was who was citing the research on 40% less earning potential or like 40 percent decrease in economic um, potential over time uh, when you're incarcerated so I think I mean there's so many right it's like from the destabilization of somebody like I'm a I work at a public defender office so that very first moment of arrest of like I was expecting my dad to come pick me up at school but instead he was arrested for having a little bit of marijuana in his pocket you know like that it's like that initial destabilization of you know, parents who call us totally frantic because they have no idea, um, you know, mothers who call completely frantic because she hasn't heard from her son in three days. And it's because he had a summons months ago that he never returned on for some ridiculous little thing and then got stopped in like some kind of stop and frisk or whatever situation. And the warrant came up on the summons and he ends up in central booking without even a tw the 24 hour, you know, the right to be seen in 24 hours because he had a warrant, right? Because of the summons. So that's like the very <laughs> beginning to people who, you know, long sentences, the post 1980s, the sentences that we have now where people go away for years and years and years um, and that affects their earning potential and they come out with child support um, debt even though they weren't able to earn any income while, or barely, you know, any income while they were incarcerated. And, you know, children, meanwhile, get removed and placed in foster care. Um, since 1996, just about any conviction for almost any crime makes you deportable, um, which has a huge impact on families when, you know, breadwinners are facing deportation for, like, turnstile jumping, which happens, let alone drug convictions or anything more serious. Um, I mean, I could sort of go on and on, but I think the impacts are pretty severe for families. Thank you. Okay, next question. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Please. William Stafford Jr. came as the Rex. I was incarcerated under Robert Morgenthau, a.k.a. Freddy Krueger. In addition to him, I'm also going after his successor, Cyrus Vance, who's just as bad as him and Robert Johnson, whose home address is 84 Beach Street Lane in Pelham, not Bronx Island, a.k.a. Bronx, according to USPS.com. So therefore, 
he disqualified he's disqualified to be my board prosecutor my illegitimate board prosecutor thank you. Uh, just to keep you informed thank you uh, yeah I have to leave I'm very sorry I have to go teach uh, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you very much okay. thank you Okay. Hey guys, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jasmine Villamel. I'm a hold up. I'm in a Pinkerton Fellowship. And so basically I agree with all you guys on the community involvement and I'm so like happy to hear. I I interned with you guys in the Bronx Defenders and I was in love with your work and the interdisciplinary um model. Um so I just want to give props to that. I know those stories that you told that are just so sad. <laughs> um but I did have a question. So when Jaman, Jermaine, Jamon, um, Jumani. sorry, Jamani, um, <laughs> um, when you mentioned about the community affairs thing in Washington, D.C., and how when it was taken away and that the police actually had a role, um, they tried to do that here in the, Bron in the city, I, I believe. Um, they tried to, they're trying to make the police more um, involved with the community, right? Um, I don't know exactly too much about that, but I just wanted to wonder, like, um, how do you think the police dynamic in the community would be when right now we're based on fear? Like, how would you, how would it look to you if the police weren't based on fear? Is that even possible in the, the city? Um, I just wanted more information on that. Uh, I think anything is possible. Um, how probable... I'm not sure in the in the name future in the near future. Um, they are have a bunch of pilot programs that they're doing now. Um, that's being called community policing. I'm not 100% sure that it that it is community policing. I'm, I'm, I do like some of the things that I've heard, um, but I'm not sure how it's. My thing is I'm not sure how it's impacting the police officer. That's not a part of this special program. Mm -hmm. um, that that uh, is going to interact with people day to day. If they're not bought into the ethos of of a different model of policing, then their interaction is not going to be different. Uh, in the in the model that I accept this completely, police police officers become more problem solved. So if you if there is a problem, the first tool is not an arrest or summons. It's trying to fix the problem. Like you have access to other people that can help that person, that family, that block deal with whatever issue it is. Uh, so that arrest and summons and, and introduces someone to the criminal justice system is not the first thing that that, that happens. And I don't think that's what the NYPD has. Uh, it would be great if they're headed in that direction, which they say they are. But what I'm worried about is, even though I like the pilot programs, I'm worried about that if folks adopt community policing, but haven't changed the methodology of how police are interacting okay. Uh, every day, and so we have the community affairs uh, units. Uh, a lot of them are great, actually, and, and they they've been um, they've been under appreciated for quite some time. But it needs to be you know, community policing is not a beat cop. Uh, it's not uh, a special program. It's an adoption of a philosophy from the commissioner down to the officer who walks the street. Every day. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that has happened. I think we're uh, a while away from that, and I think it takes some time. Although they've said that that's the direction they want to go, I'm not sure, and I'm I'm worried about the co-option of that word uh, community policing that we're going to be chasing. But it would be great to see it happen. I do think it's possible. I think it happened uh, in other places. Obviously, New York is different. But there's this is the seventh largest army in the world, uh, about 34,000 uh, police officers. Um, so it is very different, and it takes a while for people to accept. It. So one of the problems is us voting in elected officials who say they'll be tough on crime by arresting people. Um, and then that gives power to us to bring in people who will have a different philosophy. So we also have to believe and understand that that is not the methodology that works. Can I just add something really quick to that? I think there's the sort of this, like, the baseline of policing, right, should be do no harm. And what there's a really compelling parallel with the research, which is that incarceration, it turns out, at least in a lot of some localities, like makes things worse. Like it makes things worse in a lot of ways, but it even makes crime worse. 
And I think we don't have the research on it, but I, I would hypothesize that policing has the same effect in a lot of places because of exactly what, what Councilman Williams is, is describing. And so, you know, I think there's all of those programs and pilots and models. They're all great. I'm happy to see all of them. But but just to echo him, like, you have to, like, if we don't significantly reduce overall just criminal justice contact for people, especially mm -hmm. black and Latino people, young people in communities of color, like, it's just not going to work. None of those pilot programs is going to mm -hmm. make that, you know, is, is going to, make the change that we need to see if we don't have that broader scale change. Thank you. Thank you. And so it's, we're also emphasizing here that it's important to um, not simply as an alternative to incarceration have a system of fines that drives people further into the system, but we're talking about trying to have a problem solving dialogue where police, community together solve the problems that they face. Um, okay, next question. Uh, good morning. My name is Banapsha. I'm also a Pinkerton Fellow, and I'm currently placed at Exalt, which is a small nonprofit organization working with court involved youth. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, my first one kind of tags off of what um, Jessalyn already mentioned. And I was wondering if the community is involved um, in policing, do you think it will lead to more distrust and disunity um, in the sense that they might feel like they're snitching on somebody that, you know, is drug dealing or involved in some criminal activity? Is that me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the, the one of the problems that people have said of community policing um, was that um, people, the only critique I've, I've really heard was that they're worried that the community would forgive too many. Um, but that hasn't happened, I've seen, in the miles that I've seen. Snitching is a, is, a, is a whole different thing. I think the people that live by that uh, snitching code are or, or not the people who are probably going to give that information. But there are a lot of people who actually want to give information and look to give information, but don't trust the police to give that information. Um, also, I always want to be careful when we talk about snitching because it's called something here, but someplace else is the same thing. You have the blue wall of silence uh, in the police department but that often doesn't get talked about when you talk about snitching. They try to pretend it's not an actual human thing that, that people think. But many of us are actually working on the, on the gun violence stuff. It's trying to change what people perceive snitching to be. Um, because if people are confused. So if you and I commit a crime and I get caught and I tell you that may be a case of snitching. If a grandmother is looking out the window and sees somebody's head get blown off, um, that's not snitching. That's self-preservation of a community. And I think people have confused the two. Mm -hmm. And it really, there's been an effort uh, from credible messengers who have been in that life mm -hmm. to really try to change the definition of snitching because mm -hmm. they're trying to force communities to be afraid of self-preserving on themselves. But I don't, I don't think that will be as big of a problem as people think. And in DC, the opposite happened. Thank you. And my second question is for Mr. Clear. Um, when we were talking about Newark, um, you said that there's a high degree of concentration there of crime and incarceration. I was wondering if that was because of over-policing in those areas? Uh, no, I, I don't think Newark is over-policed, uh, although the Newark Police Department is under consent decree right now because of the, co the nature of the policing that's been done there and the same issues that we've been talking about. Uh, the, the Justice Department found uh, to be um, uh, legally, um, to raise the level of uh, unconstitutional treatment of, of citizens there. Now, uh, Newark recently uh, reduced, reduced its police department by 300 uh, uh, uniformed officers because of financial problems, uh, uh, fiscal issues. There's no, uh, uh, there's a very problematic uh, economic infrastructure for the city of Newark. Um, there's a lot of people making money on Newark. Most of them make the, who make the money on Newark don't live in Newark. Uh, and, uh, and so the money that G Newark generates leaves Newark very quickly. Uh, Prudential is there, um, Panasonic is there. Um, so what those of us uh, who, are, who care about Newark are trying to do is to find ways of, of increasing economic, uh, economic activity Every time a dollar changes hands in Newark, it's two dollars of economic value for Newark. But what happens is that um, people make Newark uh, money working in Newark; they go home to Montclair and spend it. So, uh, um, and I think the policing problem is is similar in that um, uh, these neighborhoods. So uh, people in Newark feel under policed in the sense that they feel under protected, 
and they feel over-policed in the sense that they feel that their young men are uh, under um, inappropriate surveillance. And uh, it doesn't sound like that's a story that can go together until you live it. And you can see how it does go together. But, but by the way, those are people, uh, I, I, get, I get a lot of flack right now because I'm, I'm part of the city council that's, uh, that's proposing a thousand new offices. Uh, there's several reasons why I'm doing that. I don't think it changes, out of 34,000, I don't think it changes how good or bad the problems can be. But um, the thing that he said is just true. There are communities that at the same time ask for additional offices and are pissed that their sons and nephews are uh, stopped questioning and frisk and don't want to be abused. And so that is a very a true thing that is uh, that is in the minds of people who live in this community. Let's say one more thing. So 911 calls, what arises to an emergency that gets an immediate response in Newark, you would be surprised to know. Uh, so the people call 911, they got something going on, they're reporting a car is being broken out broken into by somebody outside their house and they are watching it happen, that's not an immediate response to emergency because of the level. So Newark is under-policed at the same time that it's over-policed. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, how are you? Thank you again for coming. Baseline thing we should all say. Um, my name is Spencer. I work at Advocates for Children, so I kind of work on the other end of it before they get to the criminal justice arena. I'm trying to stop that before that happens to Advocates for Children. Um, what I have is back to the research. Why are why is crime and blackness mitigating factors in the <laughs> research? Because um, to bring it back to New York City, I live in Jamaica Queens. Um, it's a stable community, like financially, but it's also the highest stop and frisk um, rate out there when it was big. Um, like a, a, a very high volume of policing out there, and where is the crime? There's no, there's not a lot of crime rate. So why uh, why is blackness such a mitigating factor in these places where poverty is not exactly there existing or these other leading to actual crimes are not actually being policed. So. I, I'll just say I think it's the numbers speak for themselves. I, I, underlying all of this conversation is, uh, is, a, is a, um, a poorly um, discussed issue of race. And, um, and I don't think we have appropriately confronted the implications of it, multi-generational, uh, cultural, and economic. Um, so you'll see that what sets Newark apart is how black it is. And so, so, you, so that means something. Um, and I don't think we are very good at saying what that means, just as I don't think we're particularly well uh, um, finely tuned about knowing what that means. But clearly, a, a legacy of racism is at the roots, and, uh, and therefore um, uh, ending, this, uh, ending the implications of a legacy of race, racism is a, a core part of the solution. I think Michelle Alexander got it right. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that, that's right. So poverty and economics is, is a big one, definitely. Uh, but always underlying everything is race. Uh, I can't remember the years exactly, but I think it was 08 to 2011 or 2003 to 2011 when they did a study of um, bicycle on sidewalk stop. And uh, in Park Slope, there was about eight per year citations. In East New York, there was about 1,400 a year. In <laughs> Bed-Stuy, it was over 2,000 a year. And I believe that white people ride bicycles on the side. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just a hunch. <laughs> and so there was, there was only, uh, there's only certain differences in those, um, those communities. And so you, you can't get away from it. As much as we, people try to bring it up and people push back. And so there are two things that I think are reasons why people push back. One is I think when you talk about the systemic and systematic problems with racism in the structure, some people feel you're calling them a racist. And so we have to get, get away from that. No individual person is a racist because this system structure exists. It just exists, it's a matter of fact. And so we can, pretending that it doesn't exist is a, is a problem. And then I think people are trying to say, you're trying to make an excuse as opposed to dealing with personal responsibility where this problem with institutional racism and personal responsibility intersect, they're not separate. And so I think we have to get those two things out and so people can feel more comfortable um, just because, you know, you know, I happen to be, I always say black for most of my life, um, <laughs> but just because, you know, I'm black and someone's white, it, you don't have to feel like, oh, I'm a racist because the system is the way it is, it's just the way it is. I, it, the only thing that helps is just admitting that's the way it is and helping um, for it to get better. And 
allowing people to say, okay, this system is problematic, but I also have my own personal responsibility. Those two things uh, can go together and have to go together. But I think that's the only reason I could think of, except for people just wanted to continue. But uh, other than that, uh, I think those are the reasons that people have a knee-jerk reaction when they hear these things. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're going to have time for just two more quick questions. Okay. How you doing, Kevin? Thank you. Thank you all for, for being here today. So Ronald Dave, the Associate Vice President for the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society, and also a third-year criminal justice doctoral student, CUNY Graduate Center slash John Jay. So my question is about, so I'm, I've recently read an article by Michael Tarnry and also one by Jeremy Travis in Criminology and Public Policy, and both talk about remodeling American uh, uh, sentencing. And so we've been talking about the optimism that exists around our criminal justice system and a shift in the pendulum. Uh, Tanri kind of says we, we might be a, a little ahead of ourselves because the sentencing laws that got us into this problem in the first place mm -hmm. have been changed minimally. Mm -hmm. And so very, very few of the harsh uh, sentencing laws, uh, life without parole now, uh, 50,000 people serving those sentences, the, ma the mandatory minimums, Rockefeller drug laws, all these different sentencing laws. So he makes that point, and he's saying, again, minimal changes have been made. The other thing is that the changes that have occurred have been mostly from the judiciary, not from the legislature. So the question is, how do we move the legislature to change that? Because oftentimes, they're influenced by their constituents, and the perception of crime among blacks is what's driving a lot of the, mm -hmm. the punitive sentencing to begin with. The other thing that I would just ask quickly also is we have not really began talking about the harshness of the sentencing. Mm -hmm. So he makes the point, and I'll read it briefly, is that uh, lengths of prison sentences in the United States are extraordinarily long compared with those in other Western countries. Sentences longer than one year are uncommon in most. Longer than three years, very uncommon. And longer than five years, rare. So the maximum sentences that can be imposed, usually for a single offense in these Western countries, usually 12 to 20 years. We give a person 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, uh, you know, totally not thinking about the, uh, the research associated with desistance and so forth. So my question is, how do we change mass incarceration without dealing with those specific issues. You Thank cannot. You. <laughs> and I, and I, I want to say that one of the concerns I have is that we spend a lot of our time talking about very important things that have nothing to do with mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So they are, and, 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 I, and I, like, I don't like to see a contest between two organizations trying to meet needs. I don't like to see a contest between conversations about justice reform. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, that I think it's very clear that the that the issue of reentry has very little to do with mass incarceration. You can't reenter from prison until you've gone there. Uh, the issue of innocence, as important as it is, has nothing to do with mass incarceration. Not nothing, but almost nothing. Death penalty, on and on and on. If we don't figure out how to talk about people who are convicted of violent crimes in a different way and handle them in a different way, we will not solve this problem. Yeah. Um, um. And I'm sorry, I have to head out as well. But um, one thing I said before, it's about us also because we don't respond or we haven't been responding to people who want to put programs in place that actually work or talk about resentencing. We, 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 we elect the people who talk about longer prison sentences and arresting more people. So we have to understand, uh, even in, like you said, but even in, in, in many of our communities, we believe that that is the way to do it, and that's problematic. Mm -hmm. And I got to put a plug in for the Fair Chance Act um, that we're trying to get um, passed in the city council, which would change uh, when people um, ask about your criminal record. Well, it's commonly called ban the box, in which people you check off I've been arrested or whatever, and they throw it in the garbage. Uh, and now we're making it so that you can't ask that question until you offer them a job. Um, and the thinking that most people go to is, well, what about a murderer? And actually, murderers have the lowest recidivism rate of any crime. And so it's the thought process that people hang on to. This stuff doesn't work.